Um, th th Mark Ranquist. Thank you, Marnie, for your, your very thoughtful presentation and, and, uh, and also for the absolution. Um, a couple of thoughts. First of all, I'm not so sure that it is entirely that there is no law. It's the question of what constitutes an offense against the law. Um, uh, liberal Protestantism is extraordinarily uh, legalistic. Uh, it's just redefined what the sins are. Yeah. Okay. So there's, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, the, the old joke is uh, that there, there, there's no, no kind of, uh, there's no kind of sin in the Episcopal Church except drinking the wrong wine with dinner, um, <laughs> or using the wrong fork. Yeah. Um, and, and so, I mean, I hear this, uh, I hear this preaching. And it is so deadly, not because, not in, in some of this legal, uh, this liberal preaching, it's not because it's so, it's so deadly because it's all on you. You have to save the world. You have to save the climate. You have to save the, uh, the whales. Um, um, you know, it, it's just an uh, equation of, of all of this with a, 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 a very different agenda in that sense. The other thing that, that's interesting to me is that a, a lot of, you, you know, th there is this sort of um, idea that, okay, um, successful American religions don't preach the law. They, don't, they only preach grace. They, uh, you know, in other words, uh, you tell the people what they want to hear. Uh, you tell the people, uh, you know, you don't preach the law at them because that's going to turn them off uh, kind of thing like this. What, do, what groups are growing? What groups are attracting people? What we know is that, that the groups that, that have standards are growing. Mm -hmm. We've known this since the 60s. We've known that, traditional, that, that, that groups that pro promote traditional morality and traditional Christian standards and who preach the law, who convict people of their sins, mm -hmm. are growing. Um, and there was a survey, I, 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 I got to track it down somewhere, but there's a survey that was out uh, a while ago that says that, um, that um, people in evangelical and conservative denominations are happier than people in liberal denominations. Um, and, and so even, even, if, even if this was a, a, a thought that somehow or another we want to attract people, to our denomination by preaching a sort of an easy gospel, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. People, I don't know, instinctively recognize it as being uh, somehow or another um, uh, wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That leads me to a comment that I wanted to make earlier, which is, um, you know, the somebody said something about you know churches with strong theology is that going to be something that attracts people and right. and um, my son is a member of Mars Hill congregation in Seattle and I mean if you want to hear a lot of strong theology you know reformed theology Calvinist theology it's preached there but there certainly is a lot of attraction to young people young adults and uh, uh, so I think the challenge is out there for us as well. Why not proclaim what we actually believe and do it with conviction? Yeah, yeah I think uh, it's probably helpful too to, to uh, make this distinction because clearly um, what's operating or what has operated and is operating now in the ELCA certainly is a certain kind of strong theology. So um, we have to... Um, um, be be even more careful <laughs> and clear um, about well this probably gets to what Dennis likes to talk about what the truth really is um, because we are in an age where and where when haven't we been an age where where we're dealing with competing truth claims um, very in very strong theologies and not all of them are Lutheran. <laughs> um, or even fall within the vast history of possibilities of Lutheranism. 
Um, so um, I think one of the things that even John was, was pointing out is this certainly what needs to happen and um, it's probably starting to come back now with some of this kind of work is continue to teach, go back to teach the basics, teaching the catechism, teaching the confessions, not um, only to the church, but also to seminarians. I mean, I have colleagues, and I'm sure some of us also could attest to this, that uh, in seminary who, you know, it's like a big boulder has been lifted from them when they're finished with all of their, their coursework and are going off to their calls and Finally, I don't have to worry about this distinction of law and gospel anymore. I don't understand it anyways. I'm just going to preach the gospel. I mean, I've heard this over and over again. You know, Even you know, people that were in the same class with me and heard the same thing. Well, there's a spirit working, I guess, uh, where and when it wills creating <laughs> faith. So, um, but, but yeah, I, th- I think you know, touching on this issue of teaching and teaching and teaching over again. I mean, we don't, by our very nature, believe original sin. We don't believe the gospel. We don't believe these things. That's why we have to be taught them. Don't and can't. Yes, thank you. <laughs> cannot. We cannot. We refuse to believe them. Thank you, uh, Mr. Theologian Lou. Um, we, we cannot believe it. We refuse to. So that, therefore, it must be proclaimed and taught over and over again because we are very stubborn. Our will is very stubborn to resist this. We can't but refuse. <laughs> yes. Yeah, go on. Um, a few years ago, we had a teacher here um, named Paul Zoll, and he's an Episcopalian, but he's really a, a Lutheran. Uh, he's Episcopalian drag. He's really a Lutheran at heart. <laughs> and um, <laughs> anyway, uh, we were. he was talking about the law and grace as a part of his theme for the week, and he spent the first day just talking about the law, and a question was raised with him regarding the tendency in our culture to remove or reduce the effects of the law by passing some kind of a law, a new law of acceptance. And he made this statement that I thought, found very helpful, and I'm going to try to restate it as he, he said it but, it, but it is directly related to absolution. He said, he said the law has its own power within us, which is always at work in us, and you cannot reduce its effect by removing or reducing it. It must be resolved. It must be resolved. And the only way you resolve the law is through absolution. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that is, for me, one of the bottom line problems of this modern theological distinction is that who is it up there said if 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 there is nothing at mm-hmm. stake then there's nothing to be resolved yeah. you just we just go along to get along and mm-hmm. and a lot of guilty people and a lot of people living in shame and and, and he needing to hear i uh, about a week ago a friend of mine is a pastor here we were just sitting and we talked a little bit and i and he, and he we've, i've realized there's something on his heart that was bothering him and he just went through a whole litany of his main sin of belittling Mm-hmm. And then I said, now, are you ready to hear? Do you believe this is a sin? I, he said, I sure do. I said, are you ready to hear God's word on this? And he said, yes. And it was great just to absolve him, you know. And I, I think that's, to me, one of the things that, again, uh, we have given up in, in, it, in our public debate, absolution. So I think it's I one that we need to reclaim. 